God's house today? Good, good. Uh, go ahead and start turning in your Bible to Luke 2. Before we turn there, I wanted to share with you something really exciting. I'm pulling it up myself. So we... Uh, pulling up my notes here. Here we go. All right. Uh, so today we are going to have our fourth and final Big Giving Sunday uh, final for the year, not final forever. Uh, we'll inevitably we'll take up a big offering at some point in our church's life, maybe even like next month for all I know. I have no idea. But uh, right now, I want you to go ahead and begin preparing your heart for that because at the end of our service today, and if you're online, you can go ahead and do this online, but we're going to give over and above the tithe toward our building fund for the purpose of remodeling our worship center stage and technology. And um, I want to go ahead and announce our worship center remodeling committee just so the church can see all of the people involved in our fellowship who are helping with this. We had already had a group, uh, a small team of our staff who was involved in this. And so I wanted to make sure that there were uh, lay people from the congregation melded into that group that was already formed doing research. And so this is uh, really a merging of those two groups. You can see all of these names. Paul Adams, who is one of our deacons, he was vice chairman of our deacons last year. He is going to serve as the co-chair of this committee with Dr. Day. And Paul is a contractor by profession. Uh, we are not using his company uh, to do this project, so there's no conflict of interest or anything like that, but just making you aware of that. And then Josh Blight, who's on our staff. Carrie Clayton, who just sang uh, this previous song. She's on it. Leo Day. Uh, Nick Horner, who's our brand new media director. Media uh, director Nick Horner's up there. And uh, I'm an ex officio member of every committee on the church per the bylaws, so that's why I'm listed on there. Irma Slager, Courtney Benson, Jay Willoughby, there's Jay, and Kevin Graham is not on this committee, but he's going to help kind of serve as a liaison between the staff and the deacons, and so uh, Kevin is on a lot of different boards and stuff in his life, so he didn't want to fully commit to that, but he said, yeah, I'll serve as a liaison, so that's what he's doing. Uh, I think that this is a really good committee, a mixture of various ages and lengths of time here in the church, but hopefully it's going to help us to have some great input. If you have ideas, thoughts, questions, comments, feel free to reach out to anybody who is on this committee, including myself, and we'd love to be able to have your input. And of course, we will have some formal town hall question and answer sorts of times, but uh, go ahead and feel free to reach out to them. Uh, we have not met or anything like that yet, but just uh, wanted to go ahead and get this committee started. This will be emailed out to the church on Wednesday. If some of you are writing this down or taking pictures, it'll be in your inbox in a matter of days anyway. But I'm really excited about that. Are you excited about our future together? I'm really excited. Let's give the Lord a hand and give him gratitude for that. Awesome. Awesome. And if this, if this is your first time here at our church, you might think, uh, what all is going on here? This is exciting stuff. We're about to remodel our worship center uh, in cash. Uh, all into God's glory. Whenever that, that money is provided, then we will uh, undertake this project. Bow your head with me, and then we're going to dive into the teaching and the preaching of the Bible together. If you're at home with us, you go ahead and bow your head as well. Lord Jesus, we pray a prayer of gratitude that we're about to dive into the Word. We pray that as we look at Luke 2, that we would understand the text better, that we would see the Hark the Herald Angels Sing Carol coming out of Luke 2, beginning in verse 8 and that we would bring you honor and glory in the study of the scripture. We pray, Lord, for those who especially don't know you as Savior, that they would be uh, encouraged as a result of hearing this text preached. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Luke 2, beginning in verse 8. Today's message is entitled, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. This is the second message in our Christmas carols series. And I'm really enjoying preaching this. This is a fun series for which to prepare. And go ahead and get out your notebook, your Bible, be ready, take notes. 
but one of the hallmarks of Christians is the playing and the singing of Christmas carols and hymns. And why is this the case? Because Christianity is a faith that sings. Think about this. Agnostics don't have carols. They may have chants, they may have dirges, but there's no everlasting celebration. God enters our world, he changes our lives, and he puts music in our souls. I love that. I started to learn a little bit more about Christmas carols uh, from a series that my former pastor preached years ago, Dr. Jack Graham at Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas. And he, uh, he even inspired me for this particular message, and uh, he uh, gave me his notes from when he preached it 17 years ago. But uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of background for this message. Charles Wesley wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing in 1739. And this carol first appeared in his collection of sacred poems and hymns. But Wesley's words were sung to a pretty gloomy melody. When we opened up our service today with it, it was exciting. But when it was originally written, it was kind of sad. There was something called eco-theology that was first introduced in the 18th century where you would see how Christ would uh, redeem not only humankind, but nature as a whole. And the words from Charles Wesley's hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, really helped to explain that. Even in, in the first part of the carol, uh, it dives into it, into the third stanza. It says, Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. And so there is a beautiful contrast and explanation of this. Uh, two years ago, I got to go on a mission trip to London, and I stayed in a hotel that I had no idea when I booked this hotel. It was adjacent to Wesley's Chapel, where Charles and John Wesley ministered. It was really cool. And I started to learn a little bit more about these brothers who ministered at that church and got to visit the grave of John Wesley. One of my weird quirks is I love to visit the graves of ancient old people. I, just, I visited Lottie Moon's grave. I've even stood on top of Darwin's grave. Uh, insert joke there, but I did. Okay. <laughs> Charles Wesley and John Wesley, brothers, they were educated at Oxford, and they began what was known as the Holy Club, which was an accountability group which existed for the purpose of sharing their faith. They held each other accountable for being soul winners. And Charles Wesley really wanted to grow closer to God. And they wanted to deepen their devotion to Christ, John and Charles both. Charles Wesley feared that living faith was dying in the Anglican church. And he said this quote, Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now or afraid of your voice heard than when you sang the songs of Satan. Close quote. Charles Wesley wrote 6,500 carols and hymns. And carols and hymns, they contain great theological truth and praise to God. And every, every hymn that we sing here in our church, every new song that we sing here in our church is supposed to be uplifting the name of Christ and to be all about the Lord Jesus and not all about us, okay? So Hark the Herald Angels Sing is based upon Luke 2, 8 through 14. So let's take a look at what that passage has to say. Look with me, beginning in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were filled with fear. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. Verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was the, with the angel a multitude of of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. If you're taking notes this morning, here's point number one.
Let's firstly look at the heavenly proclamation. The heavenly proclamation. Now in the carol, it says, Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. The angels became prominent in the Bible, especially as they are related to great events in Jesus' life. I want you to think about Jesus' life and where you see at least one angel present in the Bible. You see an angel present with the empty tomb. With the announcement of the conception, you see this. In the wilderness, when Jesus was tempted, you saw this. Even at the ascension, if you look at Acts 1.11, it talks about this at the ascension. It says, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, uh, who was taken up for you into heaven, he's going to come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. When Jesus Christ comes again, angels are going to accompany Jesus at that time. Okay? Angels inhabit heaven and they invade earth with God's presence. We need to get used to being around angels. Angels are messengers from God and they can appear mysteriously and majestically just like they did on the night that Jesus was born. I want to encourage with encourage you to join with me in thinking about how angels were the first proclaimers of the gospel and how we need to be proclaimers of the gospel. Do you think that the angels got a little worked up and frustrated when they heard that there weren't going to be tons of people around when they proclaimed that Jesus was coming. I mean, you, want, you think about this, where they were located and that kind of thing. Now, I wish you could see behind the scenes how our music ministry, our media ministry, our overall worship ministry, they are hustling hard to prepare for Christmas Eve. By the way, if you haven't signed up for your Christmas Eve service of choice yet, you have to get a ticket. They're free. We're, we're doing that to control crowd space And our 4.30 service already has twice as many people signed up as 3 o'clock or 6 o'clock. So make sure you go ahead and sign up on the church website. If you aren't able to do that, call the church office. We'll set you up that way. But uh, I want you to imagine our worship ministry continued to work hard for these Christmas Eve services, but hardly anybody showed up to experience them. We'd be really bummed, right? I'm telling you, they're hustling, and I'm so proud of them. Uh, The hours they have put in is insane. But think about it. The the angels showed up to just a few people. Jesus came in humility as he was born in a stable. And he was able to identify with the shepherds, people who were poor, sick, outcasts. I mean, what an outcast to what you and I would probably do. See, the the angels were resplendent with the glory of God, speaking with these farmers who were considered ceremonially unclean, socially uncouth. And the message that the people heard, it was delivered to mere peasants. It wasn't given to religious leaders. It wasn't given to Roman kings. It was given to some men, according to Luke 2.8, men who were abiding and watching. God chose little old Bethlehem. I want you to ponder, if you were making the choice of where Jesus would be proclaimed that he was to be born, we would have done it quite differently, right? We would have made sure that we were in Jerusalem or Rome. We would have made sure there was thunder and attention and all this kind of stuff. We want to make it a big thing. I mean, after all, this is the birth of Jesus Christ. (laughs) There would be meteor showers and bursts of lightning and eclipses and volcanoes erupting and the earth would shake and rattle and roll. And (laughs) we would do all that stuff, you know, if we were the ones thinking this through from our human perspective, but we somehow were able to tap into a little bit of that power. But God chose the weak to confound the wise. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, it says, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is 
low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So this carol, it invites us, coming out of Luke 2, to join the angelic host who is proclaiming that Christ is born in Bethlehem. So we now have the privilege of telling other people about Christ and his love. I just want you to say Luke 2.14 with me, okay? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. You see, the message of Jesus Christ, it does a few things. It banishes fear. We see some fear in these days, don't we? It brings joy. It blesses other people. That's what Jesus does. The message is that of a Savior. So don't get caught up with the angels and miss the announcement itself that Jesus Christ, the Savior, is born. And the most impressive part of the announcement in Luke 2, 13 through 14, where it says that suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, and they were praising God. They said, glory to God in the highest and peace. That blesses me so much to think of that. See, we don't even know how many angels that there were, but the Bible teaches that there were myriads of angels. The sky was illuminated with their presence. My mom used to make angels and sell them at Christmas time to be able to afford Christmas presents for our family. She would always make them kind of chubby and happy. She made them to look like me, I guess, but... <laughs> <laughs> these angels weren't really the ones in robes in the Bible they were ones dressed for battle okay they were dressed for battle secondly let's think about the human present okay the second stanza of Hark the Herald Angels Sing it describes the presence of God and the present from God the Father. It says in the carol, Christ from uh, highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hailed the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Uh, one of the great values of classical hymns is that Charles Wesley teaches really good doctrinal value and truth. And too many people don't know why or what they believe, and their faith is more experiential, experiential and emotional. But I want you to think about how we kind of go about our faith. People at first, at first have a truth to understand that message, and then it moves on to trust which is trusting in Christ. So they hear the truth and they trust in Christ, and then it moves on to something tactile or tangible. And that would be things that you can see or touch with the truth and with belief in that truth. So it goes from truth to trust to tactile. That's kind of how I view most people when they come to, to faith in Christ. They hear the truth, they trust in Christ, and then there's something tactile about their lives you can experience from it. And we know that this passage here, it teaches us that Jesus is God. There's a, there's a truth proclaimed here. There's a, a truth of God being, Jesus being God. It even says in the carol, late in time behold him come. You see, the world, it waited a long time, but in the fullness of time, Jesus came at the exact right moment. History and destiny converged at just the right moment. And Jesus is not God number two. He is one person of the triune God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. The book of John says that the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is God. John 1.14, it says that the word became flesh and it dwelt among us. 
Jesus is God. Say that with me. Jesus is God. See, you can't compare Jesus to anyone. Not Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad. Hark the Herald, Angel Sin, coming out of Luke 2. It teaches that there are not multiple gods that lead to heaven. See, John 17, 21, it teaches that Jesus and the Father are one. So Jesus is God. Also, Jesus is pure. He's pure. The carol teaches of the purity of Christ when it says, offspring of a virgin's womb. And we know that Jesus, he came in purity. It even says in Isaiah 7, 14, that the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. So Luke, he confirms that 700 years later, coming out of Isaiah 7, look, the virgin birth has been doubted and denied for millennia. But if you deny the virgin birth, you are denying Christianity. Okay? For Jesus to be Savior, he could not inherit our sin nature. So Jesus had to be born of a virgin. Even Larry King, in a very tender moment with John MacArthur in an old interview, he said, if I could learn one answer to one question in all the world, it is whether or not Jesus was born of a virgin. That's the one thing he would like to learn. It's really amazing if you think about it. That is the one thing that man wants to learn. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was born into purity. Jesus is God, and he was born into purity. Do you realize the importance, the significance of this theological truth that comes out of Luke chapter 2 that we proclaim in this carol? Hebrews 4.15, it says that we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect, he's been tempted as we are, yet he's without sin. He wasn't born into sin. God and sinners reconciled. Jesus bridged the gap. Man who is a sinner went with God who was holy, and Jesus came to bridge that gap. Also, we can see in this carol that Jesus is alive. He's alive. Amen? He's alive. Risen with healing in his wings. Don't you love that part of the song? The Roman guards killed Jesus, they buried him, they secured the tomb, but death couldn't hold him. Have you noticed that Christmas is becoming increasingly politically incorrect? There are no longer carols in schools, there are no longer manger scenes in most public places. Our Leon County schools in a few weeks, they're not going to have a Christmas break, they're going to have a winter break. But the music continues to play, and you can't shut it down. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. You see, Jesus lives, and if you trust your life in him, he will live in you. And that leads to our third and final point this morning. And that's the holy pursuit. The holy pursuit. And the carol, it says, Hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man may no, no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. You see, Jesus is the light of the world. And this truth leaps out from the scriptures. Isaiah 9, 2, it says that the people who were in darkness, they saw a great light. The reason why we sing is because we have a Savior about whom to sing. That's why I'm so passionate about when we're involved in musical worship here in church, we should sing because we have a Savior about whom to sing. Now, it doesn't hurt that we have an awesome worship ministry, but <laughs> let's sing to God. He is worthy. John 10.10, 10, it says the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But our God, he came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. We need to live out that life by proclaiming his truth this Christmas season. 
Now, I, I know, I understand that some of you are wounded, you're broken, you're hurt this Christmas. And I want to remind you that Jesus is here to heal the hurt, to bring hope for tomorrow. For many of you, 2020 has been a horrible, terrible year. Can I tell you, 2019 for me, the first half of it, was the worst season of my life. But God is still healing my hurting heart. And I just want to encourage you that there is light on the other side of difficult days. But here is the key. You have got to entrust your heart, your life, into Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can give you hope, only one who can give you peace. We've got a song that we can sing that angels cannot even sing, and that's the song of salvation. You proclaim that truth to Christ today and proclaim out to God, salvation is what I need. You say, well, how do I have that salvation, Pastor? You confess that you're a sinner. You believe that Jesus is God. You believe that he is the one true way to everlasting life. And you say, Jesus, I entrust my life to you. And he'll forgive you of your sins. You'll be able to dwell with him forever. I want to encourage you to stand up with me very quietly, very reverently. This is the most tender moment of the service. Those of you at home, I want to encourage you to go ahead and Get your phone ready to text the word Jesus to the number on the screen if you want to make a decision for Christ right now. For those of you here in the room, if you want to make a decision for Jesus Christ, you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, then you walk down one of these aisles here in just a moment and just come and tell me or tell one of the other ministers in here, hey, I want to receive Christ. You come forward. Others of you, maybe you have already received Christ, but you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. Those of you online with us, you can text the word Jesus and we'll follow up with you and we can talk about how you can rededicate your life to Christ. You come forward if you just want to come down and pray. There's something heavy on your heart. Maybe you want someone to pray with you, pray over you. I'd love for you to come. Those of you online, you just text that number and we'll follow up with you, I promise. But right now, go ahead and close your eyes, bow your head. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. I'm about to pray, and when I close out the prayer with the word amen, you come, you make a decision for Jesus. If you're thinking about making a decision for Christ, that is a sign from the Holy Spirit. It's time to do business with God. Maybe you have a health need. You want someone to pray over you, you come. Maybe you have a family member and you're praying that they would come to Christ this Christmas season or they would come back to God. Maybe you have a prodigal child in your life and you want them to come back to the Lord. You get down on your knees and beg God for it. <laughs>